Welcome back to Into Clear. This is your podcast host, Chloe. And I wanted to touch on something that I mentioned in an episode. An episode, it was like two episodes, relax. I think it was the first episode. And it's about my name. And I said that I wanted to be Whoopi. I wanted to be all these other things. And at the core of that is because I just didn't want to be me. And I think the thing that goes along with that starts from in utero um i don't know much about me as a baby or as a little kid because my family just wasn't in the the stages of recording or capturing or if you're me remembering that i'm a kid so the only time i ever hear my mom talk about me in utero is when she went to a checkup and in that checkup she mentioned to the doctor what name she had in mind for me and as folklore would tell you it was either going to be Chloe which spoiler that is the one that won or it was going to be Sade which I mean I could get jiggy with it if you could get jiggy with it but um, she told him the doctor uh, my pediatrician at the time or her obstetrician I don't know lady parts that well that'll be an episode too um, he told her that she should not name me Chloe because that's a name that no one will ever take seriously. That's a name that no one will ever take seriously. And she goes on about how it was a challenge for her, like challenge accepted. So that was the name that she chose. And ironic, uh, manifesting, foreshadowing, I've always struggled with my name um, and I've always struggled with people never knowing if I'm serious or not. Like they're like, I can never tell if you're being serious. And a part of that also is odd because like my ultimate dream is to be a comedian. Like I never want any situation to be too serious. So I'm always joking. I'm always making it lighthearted. I always try to find the humor in humanity. So it's an odd juxtaposition with that name Chloe but along with that want to be a comedian I get really pissed off when I am being serious it's like yes I want people to laugh yes I want people to have a good time yes I want to bring joy to the world but there are definite serious sides of me that I think all kind of get lumped into the gesture of who Chloe is now Growing up, I thought my name was very unique because honestly, it wasn't until I was about in sixth or seventh grade that I met another Chloe. And now, I mean, everyone, you go from being one of one to now being asked, is it spelled with a C or a K? Bitch, do I look like a Kardashian to any and one of y'all? And it's always frustrating because along with feeling like people don't take me seriously as Chloe, I feel as though they don't even take the time to even take the name as it is serious. Um, There's been numerous times where I've been called Cleo, which was very traumatic during the Set It Off era, which I'm a part of. So everybody called me Cleo. Uh, I guess that was some foreshadowing because Gayo. Um, It's Cleo. It's Chole. It's Clo. It's just the laziness attached to my name. It's like people's brain just refuse to just read it. Um, on top of it already being a signature name for a luxury designer like Chloe, the Chloe brand is something that's so big that I also struggled with. Can I make it in the world as a Chloe? Like that's how my name is spelled with the hyphenated, um, whatever it's spelled the exact same way. Um, so I was like, well, I can't really trademark that market that I can't really do much with Chloe because Chloe is taken. Um, and Chloe's just always been tumultuous for me. And I, it wasn't really until this particular project, because on my, on the other one, I, I, I have so many pseudonyms like Zora knows and Zora this, and you know, I just, anything but Chloe. And as I also mentioned in one of these previous episodes, I'm so concerned about my image or my legacy once I'm no longer here. And I don't ever want anyone to not know that this 
Chloe back did the work for that Zora that you all think you know. So um, in the liner notes of this podcast, I really use my name and I, I plan to use my name more. Uh, but I don't want to negate the importance of all these other pseudonyms that I've had or created in my life. But to wrap up my woes with Chloe and how you're going to hear me try to get more secure because I'm very insecure about the name Chloe. So you're going to hear it on the project. You're going to hear me in real time try to remember and and not get caught up in any racing Chloe because what I'm learning about the words you use and how manifestation works. If I'm working so hard to erase Chloe, so is the universe. And she's here, okay? But I just want to end with a I remember it like it was yesterday. I was in sixth grade and we all had to remember a monologue from Shakespeare. Um, and I was blessed, foreshadowed with, manifested with this. Excuse me. Tis but thy name that is mine enemy. Thou art thyself, though not a Montague. What's Montague? It is nor hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor face, nor any other part belonging to a man. Oh, be some other name. This is my favorite part. What's in a name that which we call a rose by any other word would smell as sweet? For some reason, I learned that within two seconds and it has stayed with me this entire time. So to sum that up for those of you who don't care or like, oh, I guess I'll sum it up for what it means to me or like what, what Juliet is saying to Romeo, which this is from Romeo and Juliet. I didn't cue that in well. She's talking to Romeo and she's saying the only thing about you that is my enemy is your last name because, you know, the Capulets and, and the Montagues were beef. It was like East Coast, West Coast for them. Um, and they're star-crossed lovers. And they're like, we can't be together because I'm your enemy. And she's like, nothing about you is my enemy, just the name that you happen to be born with. And when she says, that which we call a rose by any other word with smell as sweet just always sticks out to me. It's like, you can call me whatever you want to call me. You can, you can use whatever vulgarities, whatever dismissive. You can do all the things you want to do to me as Chloe, but I'm still going to be this great Chloe. I'm going to be this thing that you can't tarnish with your words. Um, so, hi, y'all. I'm Chloe. Um, I'm Chloe. <laughs> Chloe, in quotes, Zora because I don't have a middle name, Beth. Uh, which also, there's some insecurities around that middle name, and we'll talk about how Zora became that here pretty soon. So, in that episode, I definitely said, uh, I wanted to be Whoopi Goldberg. I wanted to be like Whoopi Goldberg. I wanted to be like the Betty Whites. I wanted to be like the Lucille Balls. I wanted to be, be, be. And from a, a small piece of that is that I just love their work so much. I love how it made me feel. I love how it made me feel seen and be representative of me as who I thought I was or the type of person I would like to become or the type of comedian or the type of just energy that I want to put back out in the world because I always say those particular people showed me myself. They saved me. They were my friends when I didn't have any. They were just at the core of it representation. So I don't want to negate that part of why I wanted to be like them or, or things like that. But I want to I want to focus more on how I didn't understand the, the the ability to say what I just said to you all. I truly thought I had to erase all of who I was as Chloe and step into this new person to become the next Whoopi Goldberg. This new person to become the next. Kid Fury and Crystal, this new person to become the next Lena Waif. I always thought I had to divorce Chloe in order to be great like those people. And it's also always a little stingy because Whoopi Goldberg, then, you know, it's Karen Johnson. So I emulated that. I was like, oh, she didn't take her stage name, and you know, or she didn't take her birth name. She made the stage name. And I think there's a conversation to be had about a stage name versus a real name and, and what that does to your art and how you can divorce it 
from time to time and say, oh, that was me, the jester, and this is me, the person. So I still struggle with that, but you'll, you will get through it. But I just wanted to be more than Chloe. And being more than Chloe just always felt more accomplished. It felt more authentic. It felt, it felt like something that the people who I was trying to impress or the, or the people who I wanted to notice me, it always felt like it made me different. It made me special. It made me something you can take serious. Um, so I say all of that. I say so much of that to say insecurities lie in the most random fucking places. Oh, I think about how I just let people spell my name wrong, pronounce it wrong, uh, take liberties in, in where you put the accent or how you put the accent, or I even allow people to, to give me nicknames, which I used to always be so frustrated because my nicknames always seem to be more complex than just calling me Chloe. Like, you know, I'm Clo Clo Clovo, Pineapple, Phoebe, I'm I'm Big C, I'm like Cloesha, I'm so many things. And I'm like, but even the way in which people give me those loving pet names, they add so much to tell me that just Chloe is not enough. Damn. My whole life I've just been fighting with this name that I really think is beautiful. I love having the name Chloe. I think Chloe is just so, A, it gets a bitch in the door via interview because Chloe Beck sounds like she could be any old Anglo-Saxon uh, waspy Karen out there. But it also kind of helps lessen the background of where I'm from. You know, the neighborhoods where I'm from, there were no Chloe's. And there were hyphens and, and, and asterisks, but not placed traditionally. You know, Chloe just, while that doctor thought it didn't take, it wouldn't uh, allow people to take me seriously, it definitely othered me in a way that probably protected me through some of the more harsher times of my life in terms of growing up in the projects or being an inner city youth to a single parent home where mental health and alcoholism and abuse was present. Um, Chloe, I'm a, my stature, which we'll get into that too. Like for those of you who don't know, I'm five, five and a quarter, but shrinking. Uh, I'm now at about the 250, 200, 250, 260 range. Um, two years ago I had weight loss surgery, which was gastric sleeve. So for two years in my life, I've been at this 260, but for too many years to count, I tipped the scale at 397 pounds. So I had a big stature and I was a big person. And I, I you know, having a small name like Chloe kind of helped with the juxtaposition of how I presented daily. So I love it. Chloe, 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 the, the intricacies of me, the pieces of me, and just how Chloe has played a role. But Okay, clearly I'm a fan of Chloe because I keep getting off topic, but you guys are here. You don't care. Um, but I want to get back to the, the, the whoopies and the, and the things of that genre. Um, I, I went through all of this to tell you that there will be a segment called Dear Zora. <laughs> oh, hey, I told you we're going to, it's rough, it's raw, we're figuring it out together, but... So I say all that to say that while I no longer will use the language I want to be Whoopi Goldberg, I want to be Robin Roberts, I want to be, insert whomever else who's inspired me to want to create, I still want them to know that. I want them to, oh, I used to always say I was going to be the next Wendy Williams, which, <laughs> pin that, could still be true. Uh, she's another person. While I appreciate the art and the craft and the representation and, and the, the abilities that they have shown me that I have, I will no longer want to be anybody else but me. But with that being said, I think a segment that I would love to bring to 
this podcast is what I, I've, I've penned Dear Zora Letters. So I mentioned before that I go by Zora. Zora knows, like, I mean, there's probably a teaser out there when I was starting a full podcast. It's going to be called Zora in the City. Uh, Zora. So first, I didn't, my mom thought that Chloe Beck was enough. She didn't think that it needed a middle name. And throughout all of my adolescent, my grade school, my middle school, high school, even, even today in conversation, it's so peculiar to people that I don't have a middle name. Like there's not one on my birth certificate. My mother doesn't have one. My older brother doesn't have one. My older sister is the only one who has one and she's so different from us. So I think that is telling. But middle names don't have them. And people would be like, come on, you got a middle name. What's your middle name? Like what? Your name's not complete. Another tier of insecurity, right? So... It was my high school, it was high school, it was high school when, you know, doing the work, doing your homework really will open you up because it was high school, it was my AP English class and we had to write about an author or, I don't remember the assignment exactly, I gotta know for a fact that um, it might have been during the same time back when Oprah was released in the movie, you know, Their Eyes Are Watching God. I think that was the first time I ever experienced uh, the works of Zora Neale Hurston. I remember watching that movie with Holly Berry, and I watched it because I have a huge crush on Holly Berry at the time, but I couldn't, I could not not fall in love with the language and the imagery and an all black cast, which. I graduated high school in 2005, if that was my senior year. So, like, that that Oprah presents, There I Was Watching God, had to be 2004, 2005. And I remember sitting just silent. And the words felt like jewels. Like, it was like surround sound. It was like I, everything made me want to know more. So fast forward to my then teacher, excuse me, my then teacher with an assignment about doing an autobiography about a favorite author, I would think was the assignment if I'm being, I have an elephant like memory, so that's what we're going to say. And of course, your girl did what? Pick the Zora Neale Hurston. I wrote typed, which was an anomaly back then because computers were still like, what is this in the black community for most of us? I remember typing like a 12-page paper on the life of Zora Neale Hurston. And it started from her growing up the epitome of in blackness with a black town in, in Florida and her dad being the black mayor. and And then like you know, it kind of plays with her. It plays with her age. Like, you never really know how old Zora Neale Hurston was because birth certificates. She never really had a birth certificate. Like, so it allowed her to kind of maneuver the space of time very intricately. And it moves up into her, you know, making it all the way to the New York City during the Harlem Renaissance and how she was your favorite's favorite. And, 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 It speaks to so many injustices of black women and how while she's sitting at the table teaching, educating, sharing with the Langston Hughes of of the Harlem Renaissance and other people, she wasn't respected because she chose to stay true to her roots. She did not write white people ways, right? She chose to, to preserve the history of her black history she she wrote how people spoke and it just wasn't respected because at that time everyone was trying to be the W.E.B. Du Bois and the Talented Tenth and the Uppity Negro and she was just down home Zora but a genius nonetheless uh, nonetheless none the least um, so I that paper just I don't want to tell you her whole story because that's not how long this podcast is supposed to be. But one thing about that paper that still stands out to me and one thing about her life that still stands out to me as I continue to unearth her. She died 
as a Jane Doe. She died broke. She died defamed. But she died without her name. In an unmarked grave, one of the world's greatest folklorists, Black excellence, Harlem Renaissance pioneers died without even a name. And it wasn't until, I want to say, maybe the 70s that I think Alice Walker went on this, this quest to find her grave and she purchased her tombstone. So I tabled that, I tabled, I titled that paper Untitled. And I swore then that A, I was going to educate everyone who took the time to listen about Zora Neale Hurston and how she did not get her roses while she was alive and how without her work, some of your favorite poets probably would have never been able to pin some of the things that they pinned, how her work and her life, her actual life, it almost feels like I'm her reincarnate because I feel as though I'm living her story. I'm communicating her way. I'm playing her, her, her part. And also I'm getting to live in her city. And while I don't visit Harlem much, every single time I go, the first thing I say is Zora Neale Hurston could have walked on this street. So that is when I adopted the name, the middle name Zora, because I was too scared to tell my mom I would like to change my name to Zora. Um, on top of all the other things, we actually like the name Chloe, but there was a place that fit perfectly. So um, my, my pseudo middle name is Zora. And I always say Zora knows because Zora knew. She had some of the most famous quotes that are so relevant today. She said, if you are silent about your pain, they will kill you and say you enjoy it. And if that's not the black plight today, I actually don't know what is because we're not even silent and they still think we enjoy it. And one that I, I'm learning now to, 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 to really hold on to because it's one that I like to say, but I didn't want to include it into my life because it plays on another insecurity that I have. She says that all skin folk ain't kin folk. And Poignant then, poignant now, poignant forever in a day. Because oftentimes we assume that, and while very true, because a lot of us live the same life, got the same ass whooping, know about the same plastic bag full of bags, know about that same fire ass wicker chair, know about the, the epitome of what a jerry curl was and, and how you're not going to be running in and out of the house. Like we damn sure do live the same life in this weird loop, no matter where we're placed in the country or the world. We don't all share the same experiences. We don't have the same opinions. And we also don't have the same beliefs about blackness. So I just am so thankful for her. And I wish I could tell her this to her face, but I can't. I know I'm going to tell Whoopi Goldberg to her face. I know. Well, do I know? Because life is so precious, which is why I got to hurry up and, and, and go viral really soon so I can end up on The View before one of our times is up. But whatever the case may be, I, I have a belief that I will get to tell so many people who have impacted my life to their face that they've done so. Some of which will be celebrities, some of which will be just, not just, some of which will be people who have other career choices or patterns or paths. Some might be friends and family. But I'm going to do it in a letter. And that, that segment is going to be called Dear Zora. And I think it's only, only right that I read to you my letter that I wrote to Zora Neale Hurston in 2017. Because I had this, this idea for a podcast for some time. So, this is my letter to Zora Neale Hurston. Dear Zora, finally, I get the chance to share with you just how much you impacted my life. Zora Neale Hurston, you were an innovator, courageous, honest, creative, vulnerable, and unafraid to be black woman, piece of art. 
I like to argue that you are one of the greatest storytellers of all time. And I will argue that and win. The work you did to preserve our culture should be awarded a Nobel Peace Prize and be taught right along with the likes of Hemingway and Shakespeare in every literary canon. Thank you so much for remaining true to yourself and your craft at a time when we as black people were trying to just fit in, but not you. I find so much joy when I read your letters to others as well as when I get to taste the dialect and diction from your written works. You didn't need to fit in because you must have known just as you were enough, just as you are. Furthermore, you had to have known that somewhere at some point in this world, someone would need a role model, a guiding light, a blueprint for navigating life where you don't quite fit in. I admire how you were able to make and maintain, and maintain friendships with the likes of Langston Hughes and many more of the notable names of the Harlem Renaissance, all while being able to go back home, Florida, and enjoy moonshine and create a rhythm and blues of the South. I'm not ever too sure of when to use the term feminist, but when I think of the trailblazer that was you, it just fits. You are Dean Barnard's first black graduate at a time when black men barely had a seat at the table. You were walking across the stage. You never apologize for being who you are, no matter how many times you reinvented yourself. If I'm being frank, it literally pisses me off to know that you were not giving your roses when you could still smell them. From my research, I get a sense that you weren't taken seriously by the high literary society, that you were made out to be a joke, someone who wasn't educated enough when in reality, you had the secret all along. You understood the importance of folklore and telling our stories, fully knowing that no one else could ever do our stories justice. My sweet Zora jokes on them because today in 2017, asterisk 2020, we as a black culture are starved for our past, longing to understand, longing to understand our now and terrified of our futures. We look for big screens, small screens, and anyone who can give our narrative life. You must have been a prophet while clearly being a visionary. No history book can explain to me what the desperation Janie felt when having to lose tea cake, when on the news daily we see tea cakes being taken from us by the prison system, by black on black crime, and by the rabies that is the police. You knew, you knew. Your light dimmed way before its time. Your fame and fortune burned to a crisp as you died a Jane Doe, buried without a tombstone. How did they, how do we, continue to let our national treasure slip through our fingers, Zora. Sorry, slip through their fingers, period, Zora. They burned your last works, your typewriter, your legacy. We lost you for a period, but someone just like me knew the impact and the importance of you. Zora, from his eyes are watching God, to dust tracks on the road and all the short and not so short stories in between. Your pen was that of magic, your life that of mystery, and your ending, nothing short of a tragedy. And because of that, dear Zora, the phoenix that you always were is the phoenix that I'll make sure you will always be because I will literally carry your name with me to remind the world of who you were, who you are, and who you inspired me to become. Thank you, Chloe, in quotes, Zora Beck. <sighs> so, uh, I don't 
think I want to do that every episode because that's heavy. So I think that'll be a segment that pops in when I get the spirit. I do want you to know I've written 75 Dear Zoras already. So your girl is ready with that type of content. Um, but I leave you today with just, just a question. What's in the name? Until next time, and until I don't have to say it ever fucking again, black lives matter.